even the known universe, which has been brought within our range of vision by telescope and microscope. Not to speak of radio, is too large for us to leave out of account its creator. As regards bigness, do you know what a quasar is? Recently astronomers have discovered what they have called quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars for short. These are astronomical objects that emit an enormous amount of energy in the form of light and in radio waves. Looking like a star, a quasar, quote, is apparently millions of times larger and billions of times brighter. Some quasars pulse rhythmatically. There are about 40 known quasars, the discovery of the most distant one of which was announced on May 17, 1965, and which is known as 3C-9. It is stated that this celestial object is so far away that it seems to be close to the beginning of universal time. Quoting now, the light is so far away that the light from it began to journey to earth soon after the postulated birth of the universe. The life of these quasars probably ended during the billions of years that were required for their light to reach our earth, says the report. The observed rate at which the universe is expanding suggests that it was born in a single point some 13 billion years ago, roughly three times the age of the Earth. The end of the quotation from the New York Times of May the 18th, 1965. Now from the above discovery, what do we reasonably conclude? this, that God the creator of such tremendously large things is too big to occupy a house here on the earth. To speak of such a God as occupying a man-made house on our tiny earth sounds ridiculous, and rightly so to the 20th century scientists. How could such a God make himself so small? And yet the clergy of Christendom speak of God as making himself so tiny as to occupy the minute egg cell in the womb of a virgin Jewish girl, Mary. The Holy Bible itself does not teach such a thing. What it does teach is that God the Creator transferred the life of his only begotten son from heaven to the womb of this Jewish virgin to become the man Jesus, who later came to be called Christ. According to what the angel Gabriel announced to the virgin Jewish Mary, her firstborn son was not God himself, but the son of God. She was not the mother of God, but the mother of the Son of God. But as regards God, the Creator himself, the Christian Apostle Paul said to pagan Greeks, Men of Athens, I behold that in all things you seem to be more given to the fear of the deities than others are. The God that made the world and all the things in it, being as this one is, Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in handmade temples. Neither is he attended to by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives to all persons life and breath and all things. And he has made out of one man every nation of men to dwell upon the entire surface of the earth, seeing therefore that we are the progeny of God we ought not to imagine that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, like something sculptured by the art and contrivance of man. 
Acts 17. So the God about whom the Holy Bible teaches does not occupy an earthly material building in the way that some gold, silver, or stone statues occupy a temple, pagoda, or what, or one of the idolatrous religions of this world. However, the true God of heaven and earth can sanctify a tabernacle or temple that has been built in obedience to his commands. He can also put his name on such a building that he is thus sanctified and made holy. Such a temple can therefore be spoken of as the house of God. Not a home in which he dwells literally in person, but a house where his pure worship can be carried on. This is true of the temple that King Solomon completed in Jerusalem in the year 1027 before our common era. In answer to King Solomon's prayer, God said to him, I have heard your prayer and your request for favor with which you requested favor before me. I have sanctified this house that you have built by putting my name there to time and definite, and my eyes and my heart will certainly prove to be there always. First King 9.3 When King Solomon, the temple builder, was dedicating this magnificent religious building on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, he plainly said that he did not expect the mighty creator of heaven and earth to occupy this temple in a literal way. In his prayer of dedication, King Solomon said, But will God truly dwell upon the earth? Look, the heavens, yes, the heavens of the heavens themselves cannot contain you. How much less than this house that I have built. And you must turn toward the prayer of your servant and to his request for favor, O Jehovah my God, to listen to the entreating cry and to the prayer with which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may prove to be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you said, My name will prove to be there, to listen to the prayer with which your servants pray toward this place. King Solomon was reasonable. We too must be reasonable, just as the Holy Bible is in the way that we think about God's house. The temple that King Solomon built housed no man-made statue to represent God. The presence of Jehovah God at this temple was symbolized by what has been called the Shekinah light a light that miraculously illuminated the innermost compartment of the temple, the most holy. When the high priest went in there each year on the atonement day to sprinkle the sacrificial blood of atonement before the sacred ark of the covenant, the high priest was privileged to behold this miraculous light. Aside from that, there was no statue or image in the temple of Jehovah to represent him. In fact, the first and second of his Ten Commandments absolutely forbade the making and idolizing of handmade images and statues. This agrees with the fact that the living and true God wants worship by his creatures direct, and he is too big to be housed in any man-made temple. After the first temple was dedicated in Jerusalem, God said in warning to King Solomon, its builder, and to his royal successors, if you yourselves and your sons should definitely turn back from following me and not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have put before you men, and you actually go and serve other gods and bow down to them, I will also cut Israel off from upon the surface of the ground that I have given to them. And the house that I have sanctified to my name I shall throw away from before me. And Israel will indeed become a proverbial saying and a taunt among all the peoples. 
and this house itself will become heaps of ruins. Everyone passing by it will stare in amazement and will certainly whistle and say, for what reason did Jehovah do like that to this land and to this house? The thing here warned of actually happened to the temple built by King Solomon. This is because the kings of Israel, with few exceptions, defiled and profaned Jehovah's house or temple. In the summer of the year of 607 before the common era, it was laid in ruins by the Babylonian armies under King Nebuchadnezzar. Had Israel treated God's house with due respect, this would not have taken place. But the Israelites did not respect the house on which God had put his name Jehovah. And so this warning proved to be a mere idle threat, to be no mere idle threat. The 70 years from 607 to 537 before our common era, it laid in ruins while the deported Israelites were exiles in the distant land of Babylonia. Can we today lightly brush aside this historical fact as if uh, having no meaning to us now? No. For the antitypical commentator of Israelite history, the Christian Apostle Paul warns us. Now these things became our examples for us not to be persons desiring injurious things even as they desired them. Neither become idolaters as some of them did. Neither let us practice fornication, as some of them committed fornication. Neither let us put Jehovah to the test, as some of them put him to the test. Neither be murmurers, just as some of them murmured, only to perish by the destroyer. Now these things went on befalling them as examples, and they were written for a warning for us upon whom the ends of the system of things have arrived. Consequently, let him that thinks he is standing beware that he does not fall. 1 Corinthians 10. Future generations are apt to repeat the mistakes of previous generations unless they take to heart the lessons taught by past history, especially Bible history. So like people of the past, they suffer the same or similar bad consequences for the same bad conduct toward God's house. We of the present generation should desire to be like Nehemiah, the governor of the province of Judah in the 5th century before our common era. He took vigorous steps to halt the abandoning or neglecting of God's house among his chosen people. This is not Solomon's temple which had been destroyed in the 7th century before the common era, but was the temple that had been built in the 6th century after the remnant of worshipable Jews returned from the land of Babylon to Jerusalem. After mighty Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians in 539 before the common era, the land of Judah became a Persian province under Cyrus the Great in 455 BC. King Artaxerxes, a Persian, appointed Nehemiah to govern the province of Judah and Jerusalem. Nehemiah did not ignore Jewish history up till then. He did not want, to he did not want the restored Jews of his generation to suffer calamity for mistakes like those of their ancestors. To that end, he used the power of his governorship. It was not Nehemiah's fault that this rebuilt temple in Jerusalem suffered destruction by the Roman legions under General Titus in the year 70 of our common era. The temple of Jehovah that was then destroyed uh, has never been rebuilt. And today we find on its former location a different structure known as the Dome of the Rock dedicated to Allah of the Muslims or Mohammedans. 
and investigation of the cause for this uncovers that it resulted from a misuse or abuse of the rebuilt temple of Jehovah. Truly Nehemiah had been concerned all right and he had not taken matters any too seriously. We do well to examine what measures Nehemiah took. First, Nehemiah enlisted the efforts of the restored Jews to rebuild the protective wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. Then he turned his attention more to the things of the temple and to the spiritual condition of the people of Judah. In the lunar month following the completion of the walls of Jerusalem, namely in the 24th day of the month of Tishrei, the people who had just finished celebrating the festival of booze at Jerusalem gathered together in a more serious mood, quote, with fasting and with sackcloth and dirt upon themselves, Nehemiah 9.1. By that time, the writing of all the inspired Hebrew scriptures, 39 books, had been completed, with the exception of the books of Nehemiah and Malachi. However, on this solemn occasion, there was a reading from the book of the law, the five books of Moses, for a fourth part of the daylight period, or for three hours, after which they made confession of their sins of both themselves and their forefathers, and also bowed down and worshipped before Jehovah their God. Then prayer was offered up for the whole people by some ministerial Levites, who stood upon the raised platform. The prayer closed with this statement as recorded in Nehemiah 9, 36 to 38. Look, we are today slaves, and as for the land the Jew gave to our forefathers to eat this fruitage and its good things, look, we are slaves upon it, and its produce is abounding for the kings that you have put over us because of our sins and over our bodies that are ruling and over our domestic animals according to their liking and we are in great distress. So in view of all this we are contradicting a we are contracting a trustworthy agreement both in writing and attesting by the seal of our princes our Levites and our priests. Nehemiah himself was one of the princes, or heads of the people, to attest by seal to the binding power of this trustworthy agreement in writing. All the rest of the people, clad as they were, in sackcloth and with dirt upon themselves, backed up their princes, their priests, and representative Levites, and put themselves under oath and the liability to a curse with regard to this trustworthy agreement and arrangement, all being determined to bring themselves into harmony with God's law and all of his requirements. In this way, they acknowledged again that they were obligated to avoid all mixed marriages with the pagan neighbors inside the land and round about. They would also insist on observing the weekly Sabbath day and the Sabbath year every seventh year and its cancellation of all debts owned, owed by their Israelite brothers. And as for the house of God, the 61-year-old rebuilt temple of Jerusalem, they imposed upon themselves a head tax of a third of a shekel, about 20 cents in silver, each year toward the expenses of the temple to maintain the services rendered there. Also, much wood needed to be provided for the fire of the altar on which the many sacrifices were offered each day, and the providing of the amounts needed regularly was distributed among the people. Besides that, there was the first fruits of the law of God commanded to be presented by the Israelites, the first fruits of their fields and their orchards, and the first fruits of their flocks and herds and also the human womb, their firstborn sons. These offerings were in addition to the tenth part or the tithe of their increase each year to support the priests 
and the ministerial Levites who regularly served at the house of our God. Even the Levites who served at the temple were under law to offer up a tithe or tenth part of what they received, this to go to the priests, so that thus the temple Levites shared in the tithing arrangement and made their proper contribution in support of God's house. At the temple was where the utensils of the sanctuary were and also the priests to use such besides the gatekeepers and the singers. All these needed material support in payment of their spiritual services. A neglect in rendering all these necessary things to support the temple servants and to maintain the temple operations would be a neglecting of the house or temple of Jehovah God, especially now in face of the attested trustworthy arrangement in writing and the oath and the liability to a curse from God as now undertaken by the Israelites. They should not again become guilty of neglect, especially of the house of God. Nehemiah, the governor of Judah, included himself under the obligation when he said, we, not you, we should not neglect the house of our God. Nehemiah 10, 30, 39. What a powerful statement worth remembering and observing is Nehemiah's statement to Jews who were dedicated to the nation, to Jehovah God, and who were professing to be his worshipers. How prone the fallen human flesh is to give in to materialism and to overlook the spiritual interests and benefits and thus to fall into a neglecting of God's house. Governor Nehemiah found that out. After serving as governor for 12 years, he returned to the royal palace of the Persian king, namely, in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king of conquered Babylon. Then after an absence from Jerusalem, the length of which he does not tell, he returned to Judah and Jerusalem with permission of the king of Persia. He himself had not lost interest in God's house, but sadly he found out that the people of Judah had lost their interest. Elisha, the high priest, had admitted an enemy Amorite, Tobiah, who had uh, opposed the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, he had admitted him into the temple. He had also become a relative of Tobiah and had assigned to his personal use one of the dining halls in the temple courtyard where formerly supplies for the support of the temple servants used to be stored. This was contrary to God's command in Deuteronomy 23, 3-6. What seemed all right to the temple high priest was tolerated by the people, but not by Nehemiah, he tells us. It seemed very bad to me. So I threw all the furniture out of Tobiah's house outside of the dining hall. After that, I said the word, and they cleansed the dining halls. I proceeded to put back right there the utensils of the house of the true God with the grain offering and with the frankincense. Not only had high priest Elisha admitted to the temple dining hall an undesirable any enemy, Ammonite, but he took no steps to keep the legitimate Levites of their God-given post of duty, at their God-given post of duty, at the temple. He let the contributions of the tenth part of, or the tithes of the Israelites drop off so that the ministerial Levites did not receive the necessary material support. Many of these felt obliged to leave the temple work and go on home to their Levite cities and work their garden lands round about for food supplies for themselves and for the families. So what did Nehemiah do? He reports. I got to find out that the very portions of the Levites had not been given them so that the Levites and the singers doing the work went running off each one to his own field. And I began to find fault with the deputy rulers and say, Why has the house of the true God been neglected? 
Consequently, I collected them together and stationed them at the standing place. He did not wait any longer for action by the deputy rulers, but arranged that all the inhabitants of Judah brought in the tenth part to the temple storehouses. Besides this, Nehemiah did not wait upon the delinquent high priest Elisha, but, as he said, I put Shalemiah, the priest, and Zadok, the copyist, and Padiah, of the Levites in charge of the stores, and under their control there was Hanan, the son of Zucru, and the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful, and upon them it devolved to do the distributing to their brothers. So now the ministerial Levites had no reason to run home. Afterward, when Nehemiah prayed to Jehovah God to remember him for good, to what did Nehemiah refer as a basis? for such a plea. Did he mention that he had left his position as cupbearer of the king of Persia and had made the long journey to Jerusalem and had rebuilt the walls in 52 days despite enemy threats? No. But he spoke of what he had done in behalf of the house of God. He prayed, Do remember me, O God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my acts of loving kindness that I have performed in connection with the house of my God and the guardianship of it. He insisted on clean servants ministering at God's house, but not so the high priest Elisha, for he had let the grandson and his, uh, of his enter a mixed marriage and marry the daughter of a Samaritan enemy, Sanballat, the Hornite. As regard this, Nehemiah says, and one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. So I chased him away from me. The report of this action for the benefit of God's house, Nehemiah follows up by saying at the close of the book that bears his name, do remember then, O oh my God, on account of the defilement of the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. And I purified them from everything foreign and proceeded to assign duties to the priests and to the Levites, each one to his own work, even for the supplying of the wood at appointed times and for the first ripe fruits. Do remember me, O oh my God, for good. Will Jehovah God answer that prayer of Nehemiah of 24 centuries ago? Yes. And it will be done for Nehemiah's everlasting good. Jehovah God is not unrighteous so that he has forgotten and will leave unrewarded all the good that Governor Nehemiah did for the house of his God in Jerusalem. He has kept Nehemiah's prayer for remembrance on permanent record by having it made a part of the inspired Holy Scriptures. To the Hebrew followers of Jesus Christ, who has done even greater service in behalf of the true house of God, it is written, God is not unrighteous so as to forget your work and the love you showed for his name in that you have ministered to the holy ones and continue ministering. Hebrews 6.10 So too with Nehemiah. He truly feared Jehovah God and in the writing of Malachi who was evidently a contemporary of Nehemiah in the rebuilt city of Jerusalem we find these appropriate words included. At that, <clears throat> at that time those in fear of Jehovah spoke with one another each one with his companion. And Jehovah kept paying attention and listening. And a book of remembrance began to be written up before him for those in fear of Jehovah and for those thinking upon his name. Malachi 3.16 Nehemiah yet sleeps in death in Sheol or Hades, the common grave of dead mankind. But during the thousand-year reign of Messiah, the leader, 
Nehemiah will be rewarded with a resurrection from the dead. He will then find no longer a material temple of Jehovah God standing on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. He will learn what happened to the last one of the Jewish temples there in the year 70 of our common era, as foretold by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He will learn about the spiritual temple of God, the one that was prefigured by the material temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. He will learn how the spiritual temple was kept from being neglected by the followers of the great high priest of his temple. Nehemiah himself will join other faithful ones on earth in worshiping Jehovah God through this exalted spiritual temple. He will be an outstanding example of how persons who do not neglect God's house are fully rewarded without fail. Just as foretold by Daniel, the prophet, in 9, 24 to 27, Messiah, the leader, appeared in the year 29 of our common era, and then Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, was baptized in the Jordan River and was then anointed with God's Holy Spirit. As the Messiah, or Christ, he foretold the destruction of Jerusalem's temple that occurred in the year 70 of our common era. He did not try to preserve that typical house of God which was made up of fine stones and other costly materials. Yet as long as God permitted this temple to stand in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ respected it and worshipped at it. On two occasions he cleansed it of commercialism. However, Jesus Christ was more interested in the real, everlasting temple of his heavenly Father, Jehovah God. So before he made his final trip to Jerusalem to foretell the destruction of that city and its temple, he said in the hearing of his twelve disciples, Upon this rock mass I will build my congregation and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. By speaking of building his congregation or church and building it on a rock, this former carpenter was liking his congregation to a temple. He was speaking of it as a living house of God. When Jesus first cleansed the temple in the spring of 30, in our common era, he used the term temple to refer to something different from that material temple in Jerusalem. So now, in Matthew 16, 18, he likens his congregation of faithful followers to a temple built upon himself as the foundation stone. In harmony with this fact, the Christian apostle Paul, when writing to the congregation in Ephesus, Asia Minor, where the world-famous temple of the goddess Artemis, Diana, was still standing, spoke of the entire Christian congregation as a living temple. And Paul said, through him, Jesus Christ, we, both peoples, Jews and Gentiles, have the approach to the Father by one Spirit. Certainly, therefore, you are no longer strangers and alien residents, but you are fellow citizens of the Holy Ones and are members of the household of God. And you have been built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets while Christ Jesus himself is the foundation cornerstone. In union with him, the whole building, being harmoniously joined together, is growing into a holy temple for Jehovah. In union with him, too, are being built up together into a place for God to inhabit by spirit. Ephesians, the second chapter. Again pointing out that the true house of God is now a temple made up of living persons. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christian congregation in ancient Corinth, Greece. Do you not know that you people are God's temple and that the Spirit of God dwells in you if anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. 
For the temple of God is holy, which temple you people are. 1 Corinthians 3. The members of this symbolic temple are therefore comparable with the stones of a material temple. That is why the Christian apostle Peter calls them living stones when he writes to the Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor saying, coming to him, Jesus Christ, as to a living stone rejected it is true by men, but chosen, precious with God, you yourselves also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house for the purpose of a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it is contained in scripture, look, I am laying in Zion a stone, chosen, a foundation cornerstone, precious, and no one exercises faith in it will by any means come to disappointment. Making very clear that God's dwelling in his living temple is by means of his spirit and not by any carved statue or idol image, the Apostle Paul again writes to the Christian congregation in idolatrous Corinth. What agreement does God's temple have with idols? For we are a temple of a living God. Just as God said, I shall reside among them and walk among them, and I shall be their God, and they will be my people. 2 Corinthians 6. All these things are written by the Apostle Paul and Peter no later than five years before the Jewish temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman legions in the year 70, the Christian era. It is thus very plain that by that time Jehovah God had rejected the material temple of Jerusalem where his son Jesus Christ had been condemned to death, just as Jesus said on Nisan 11, three days before the religious leaders had him put to death, you people did not want it. Look, your house is abandoned to you. On the third day after Jesus' death, Almighty God raised him from the dead and had him return to heaven, to the heavenly Mount Zion. There God laid Jesus Christ as the symbolic foundation cornerstone on which a new living temple was to be built. Since this living temple is a spiritual house in which God resides by his Holy Spirit, it began to be built on the day of Pentecost 33 in our Christian era, when God's Holy Spirit was poured out upon the heavenly Jews who exercised faith in the heavenly foundation cornerstone. As the true house of God is a living temple made up of the faithful congregation of Christ's followers, it is easy for us to see how this symbolic house could be neglected by those who are living stones in it. And let us remember that living stones of that kind are being selected and prepared for this spiritual temple down till this very day, so that the liability of such a neglect is still with us. The Apostle Paul warned the Christian overseer, Timothy, against just such a thing, saying, I am writing you these things, that you may know how you ought to conduct, uh, conduct yourself in God's household, which is the congregation of the living God, a pillar and support of the truth. Indeed, the sacred secret of this godly devotion is admittedly great. He was made manifest in flesh, was declared righteous in spirit, appeared to angels, was preached among nations, was believed upon in the world, was received up to glory. However, the inspired utterance says definitely that in latter periods of time, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to misleading inspired utterances and teachings of demons. Certainly after he received Paul's first letter, supplemented by Paul's second letter to him, the first century Christian overseer Timothy understood more fully, as Paul wrote, how you ought to conduct yourself 
in God's household. He would be alert not to neglect any of his responsibilities towards God's house or towards the congregation. He would do just as the apostolic member of God's house had told him to do, saying in 1 Timothy 4, 14 to 16, and also from the sixth chapter, do not be neglecting the gift that you, the gift in you, that was given you through the predilection and uh, when the body of older men laid their hands upon you. Ponder over these things. Be, absor be absorbed in them, that your advancement may be manifest to all persons. Pay constant attention to yourself and to your teaching. Stay by these things, for by doing this you will save both yourself and those who listen to you. Keep on teaching these things and giving these exhortations, O Timothy. God what is laid up in you in trust with you, turning away from the empty speeches that violate what is holy and uh, from the contradictions of the falsely called knowledge. For making a show of such knowledge, some have deviated from the faith. Being an overseer of the congregation, Timothy would attend the meetings of the congregation regularly, either to direct what was going on there or to perform his part in the meeting, just as Paul told him, writing, continue applying yourself to public reading, to exhortation, to teaching. He would not miss meetings. His missing would be, cut, would be cutting himself off from God's household, which is the congregation of the living God, a pillar of truth, a pillar of support of the truth. By missing meetings, he could not discharge his responsibilities. Attending meetings is not a thing for just old folks or approaching death, but is a thing for young folks, for persons in the prime of life, as well as for those nearing the end of life's present span. Timothy was young. That was why Paul told him, that no man ever looked down on your youth. Do not severely criticize an older man. To the contrary, entreat him as a father, younger men as brothers. Not attending the meetings of the congregation is one of the most obvious ways of, fors of forsaking and neglecting the house of our God. If a member of God's dedicated baptized household willfully fails to attend, he is virtually disfellowshipping himself from the congregation. Disfellowshipping means the casting of a member out of God's household. And if he should remain in this disfellowship condition till he died, it would mean his everlasting destruction as a person who is rejected by God. Staying away from meetings leads in that very direction. So Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verses 23 to 31 says, Let us hold fast the public declaration of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another, not avoid one another, to incite to love and fine works, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together as some have the custom, but encouraging one another, and all the more so, as we behold the day drawing near. For if we practice sin willfully, after having received the accurate knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin left, but there is a certain fearful expectation of judgment, and there is a fiery jealousy that is going to consume those in opposition. For we know him that said, Vengeance is, is mine, I will recompense. And again, Jehovah will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To attend meetings in the churches of Christendom costs money, either because 
of having the collection plate or bag or the bucket pass before the attenders one or more times during a religious meeting or because of having to pay for admission into the religious building. Many persons find themselves too poor materially to make these forced contributions. But with the true household of God, there is no such financial barrier to bar them from coming to congregation meetings regularly. At all meetings of Jehovah's Witnesses, of this Christian's Witnesses, the rule is applied, seats free, no collection. One needs only to make the effort to attend meetings. Of course, where meetings are not held in private homes as in Bible times, in our first century, there are expenses that a congregation will have to bear in order to meet together regularly in a meeting hall. In that case, free will contributions can be made by members of the congregations as they are able to contribute. For this purpose, a contribution box can be placed at a convenient spot for persons to drop in money contributions without showy display. We do not care to be like the religious hypocrites of our first century who did charitable work, works and almsgiving in order to be observed by men, that they may be glorified by men. So today in the meeting places of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses, there are contribution boxes in which to drop contributions as one chooses. The money contribution is not the main thing. Although a congregation as a whole would not want to neglect the house of our God by failing to provide a general meeting place even at some financial expense as the congregation can afford. The main thing is to get to the meetings and to get to them regularly. At such meetings, by being present, one can always make contributions in other ways than in financial way. One can join one's voice in with the congregation in singing songs of praise to God. If a general Bible study is being held, one can take part by offering a biblical comment in answer to the question asked. And to this end, one can go over the study of the material beforehand. One can encourage the public speaker of the occasion by being present and showing good attention interest and appreciation. Also, before and after meetings, one can mix with the congregation members and encourage, exhort, and upbuild those whom one meets. This is a way in which one can hold fast the public declaration of our hope without wavering, and also consider one another, one another to incite to love and fine works. By self-separation in advance of such meetings, one can make it by self-preparation in advance of such meetings, one can make it very evident that he does not desire to neglect the house of our God. One thus reveals that one goes to meetings not just as a matter of routine, indifferently, but he goes to meetings with a purpose, the purpose of being spiritually built up himself and building up the other members of God's household. One can thus aid in keeping the congregation strong in faith, hope, and courage. Yes, aid in growing stronger in these vital things. One can watch to keep the purity of the congregation, not alone the purity of the faith, as it was once for all time delivered to the Holy Ones, but also the purity of the personal life in a moral sense. This calls for a person to put up a hard fight in a spiritual way, making full use of the complete suit of armor from God and fighting side by side for the faith of the good news. This helps to keep God's house in good repair spiritually. Besides this, a faithful member of God's household 
would not neglect God's spiritual house by neglecting to pray for it. Praying for it regularly at home and praying with the congregation when he is at meeting. Paul was part of the apostolic foundation of the holy temple for Jehovah. And yet in his letter to the congregation in Ephesus, he asked them to make supplication not only in behalf of all the holy ones, but also for me, that ability to speak may be given me with the opening of my mouth, with all freeness of speech to make known the sacred secrets of the good news. By sincere prayer, one shows that one is really concerned about the welfare and the prosperity of God's house. Prayer is really powerful as it is heard and answered by God when in accord with his will and his purpose. A righteous man's supplication, when it is at work, has much force. James 5.16 The prophet Daniel prayed for God's temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, but we today can pray for God's house of living stones to be kept in good spiritual condition and be preserved. David, who as king of Jerusalem desired to build a glorious temple to Jehovah God, said in grateful song, I rejoiced when they were saying to me, to the house of Jehovah let us go. Our feet proved to be standing within our gates, O Jerusalem. For the sake of my brothers and my companions, I will now speak. May there be peace within you. For the sake of the house of Jehovah our God, I will keep seeking good for you. Psalms 122. King David was a good example for us in appreciating God's house and in rejoicing at the invitation to go with others to God's house. However, let us not forget that God's true house is a living one. It is therefore an organization of activity. Divine worship is carried on by and through God's spiritual house, not just by our going to meetings of the congregation. The Apostle Peter makes it very clear that the purpose of God's spiritual house is the offering up of spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, and that the holy nation, the people for special possession, should declare abroad the excellencies of the one that called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. All this calls for activity. And if we do not want to neglect God's house, we will not fail to share in its activity. These spiritual sacrifices at God's house by his worshipers are not animal victims. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 15 to 16, it says, Through him, Jesus Christ, let us always offer to God a sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips, which make public declaration to his name. Moreover, do not forget the doing of good and the sharing of things with others, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Public declaration of God's name must be given and the doing of good must be done outside the congregation as well as within it. God's name and his excellencies must be declared throughout all the earth, among all the nations, that people of all the nations may call upon his name and be saved. This is only reasonable, for the Apostle Paul quotes Joel 2.32 and bases questions on its saying. Everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. However, how will they call on him in whom they have not put faith? How in turn will they put faith in him whom they have not heard? How in turn will they hear without someone to preach? How in turn will they preach unless they have been sent forth? Romans 10. The members of God's household take seriously their being sent forth to preach, to make known God's name and his messianic kingdom. 
for the blessing of all mankind. Little wonder then that they zealously take part in the activities of God's house. Loyally and unselfishly they support all the appointed members of God's house who take the lead in all these activities. They are like the first century Philippian congregation in its generous support of the missionary activity of the Apostle Paul. They were very careful not to neglect the house of our God in this important aspect by neglecting to share in its activities. As a result of the expanding activities of the Holy Priesthood at God's house since the close of the World War I in 1918, a great crowd of people, the final number of which is not known, not now, have flocked to God's spiritual house from all parts of the earth. And Revelation 7 prophetically describes them saying, look, a great crowd which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb dressed in white robes and there were palm branches in their hands. And they kept crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation we owe to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. These are the ones that come out of great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That is why they are before the throne of God. And they are rendering him sacred service day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread his tent over them. Do you see yourself in that great crowd? If so, then you know that the great tribulation above mentioned began with the beginning of the pangs of distress during the years 1914 to 1918 as foretold by Jesus Christ, the Lamb who shed his blood in sacrifice to God for cleansing away the sin of the world. The end of the pangs of distress upon the nations are not yet come, for that end means a total annihilation of this system of things. But this great crowd has not waited for the end of the great tribulation to come before they think of taking up the service of God. They have come out since the beginning of the pangs of distress, seeking salvation from the enthroned God of heaven and earth and through the one sacrificed Lamb, Jesus Christ. They acknowledge Jehovah God as the rightful ruler of heavenly angels and earthly men. They do not accept any longer the moral and religious standards of this worldly system of things. Instead, as pictured in Revelation 7, 9 to 15, they confess that they are sinners and they seek to get rid of their dirty appearance. So they wash their robes in the shed blood of the Lamb to take away the unsightly stain of sin. This they do by accepting Jesus Christ as God's high priest and exercising faith in the sacrifice of sins that this high priest offered. And then, by making a full dedication of themselves to God as no longer belonging to themselves or to the world or to Satan the devil, but is belonging to Jehovah God by reason of his purchase of them. No wonder that they now have an accepted standing before God whom they joyfully hail with palm branches. No wonder that they flock to God's spiritual house of which Jesus Christ is the foundation cornerstone in order that there they may render sacred service to Jehovah day and night they say to the spiritual priesthood at God's house, O oh, blessed Jehovah, all you servants of Jehovah, you who are standing in the house of Jehovah during the nights, raise your hands in holiness and bless Jehovah. And the spiritual priesthood respond to them and say, May Jehovah bless you out of Zion, he, the maker of heaven and earth. So the great crowd that keeps flocking to God's house does more than just go to meetings at his temple. They also take an active part in service that is sacred to God. 
By night as well as by day, they cooperate in rendering uh, with the rendering number uh, with the remaining number of the living stones of God's spiritual temple, who are still on this earth. They do not want to be like the Jews of the days of Governor Nehemiah, who neglected the house of God but failing to make contribution to God's worship and thus obliging Levite temple servants to leave the temple and go back home in order to work their gardens for something to live on. So realizing that they are everlastingly indebted to God for salvation through his Lamb Jesus, they keep vigilant to, in their service to God at his temple day and night. Not in vain was the prophetic picture recorded in Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 to 15. The reality of this prophetic picture is before us today. It sets a pattern for the present great crowd of earthly saved ones to follow. They do follow it now, before the end of the pangs of distress of the great tribulation which brings destruction to all the false religions and their man-made temples. Together, the great crowd and the remnant of the spiritual priesthood render sacred service to the one living and true God at his spiritual temple. Day and night, they carry out their unchangeable resolve that we should not neglect the house of our God. The happy result is that the worship of Jehovah God remains vigorous and keeps on surviving with increasing praise to him who is the source of everlasting life and blessing to all obedient men. Thank you. I'm sure that... Uh, all of us here appreciate how important it is for every one of us to continue to meet with God's people. We're very, very happy that uh, Jehovah in these last days has arranged for so many kingdom halls to be built because God's organization is growing and expanding. The society has been able during the past years to assist many of our brothers, the congregations, to build kingdom halls and the brothers in turn have sent uh, what they have received through their contributions in their kingdom halls back to the society to pay off the indebtedness and that way the society has been able to send out that money again time and time again to other congregations to build kingdom halls remember the kingdom hall itself is not the temple of God not by any means but you people are living stones. This great crowd today is meeting with these people of living stones, the remnant today, and they worship together with them. And this is marvelous. This building here is a kingdom hall. It's the main office of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in Pennsylvania. The board of directors do not spend very much time here, a few hours each uh, year at the annual meeting but the Pennsylvania Corporation is also registered in New York asking that state to give us the permission to have our office in New York City and so we carry on our business there throughout the world uh, when we get back home next week the board of directors will meet in the president's office and then according to the charter they will elect a president, a vice president, a secretary and treasurer, and a assistant secretary and treasurer for the next year. These brothers who are elected to office and the whole board that are called together from time to time to decide important matters, whether we should go this way or that way in certain work, certainly appreciate the grand privilege that they have. The board of directors of the Pennsylvania Corporation are all of the anointed. They are of the temple class. They are looking forward to the opportunity of being joined heirs with Christ Jesus, the chief cornerstone, 
in heavenly glory when they finish their work here upon the earth. But it certainly has been a great joy to them and all of the remnant throughout the world, of which uh, many of the members of the Pennsylvania Corporation uh, profess to be of the remnant. It certainly is a joy for all of them to see the great blessing that Jehovah God has poured upon his people in these last days. We see a great crowd coming in, and as was reported by Brother Souter in his uh, uh, messages from the different brothers who responded to their proxies, there has been a, a fine growth in many parts of the world. Here in the United States, we had a little better than 3.5%, or about 3.5%, just slightly under. In the growth in this country, we average more than 300,000 publishers in the United States now. As much as we'd like to see an increase of 10% uh, year after year, someday it will have to come to a conclusion, to an end, when all those who really want to come out of the devil's organization and uh, worship at the temple of God and with the remnant, and that day will come when they are all gathered, when they have all come. How long that will be, we are not trying to predict or say. Right now, we know we're very, very busy preaching the good news of the kingdom because this is a command that we have, and we know that there is a great response. As we have seen through the yearbook in the last four or five years, there have been 60,000 every year that are being baptized. Well, that means that this crowd is coming in in great numbers. I remember the day when I was in the truth, 40 years ago at least, when there were not that many publishers in the whole world. I remember the day when there were only 15 and 20,000 publishers that reported going out in the field service right around the earth. And think of how Jehovah God has gathered the remnant, built them into a, an organization of praise, and now he has indicated he has other sheep that are not of this fold, and they are being gathered until today we have well over a million who are preaching with the remnant this good news of the kingdom. But still, these must take care of the house of God. They cannot neglect it. To neglect the house of God personally may mean what was said this morning in this talk that you disfellowship yourself, you take yourself away from God's people, it may end up in your death forever. No one should be that foolish, having dedicated their life to God, to do his will, to withdraw of his own volition from Jehovah's organization. So do not neglect the house of God. It's his place of worship. It's where we belong. It's where we are spiritually fed. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Considering these texts this morning in Nehemiah, a book that we might sit down and read sometime and wonder, well, just what is in it there for us? When studied and thought out, there is so much in it that we should not neglect the house of our God. If we do not, we're going to really assure ourselves of everlasting life in Jehovah's new order of things after the battle of Armageddon. And if you know of any brothers or sisters who are not coming to the meetings of God, don't scold them. Rather talk to them as a brother, kindly, with love, and show them what it will mean to them if they neglect God's house and do not meet with Jehovah's people. We have a wonderful opportunity to do just what Jesus did. He never neglected his father's house. Even when he was 12 years old, we found him in the temple asking questions of the priests of that day. And in the very beginning of the ministry, Jesus went into the synagogue every Sabbath and preached. And you recall the occasion where Jesus went into the synagogue in Nazareth and he got up to read. The attendant handed him a scroll and said, you read. 
And he stood up and began to read to those in the synagogue, and he was quoting from Isaiah, the 61st chapter, or reading from it. And then he went and sat down, and he said, to make his comment on the scripture, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Hmm, this young man talking like that. Reading a scripture from Isaiah and say, this day this of scripture is fulfilled in years. I say it, it means me. And they must have looked at him uh, in amazement. And he went on to speak to them. But that day he didn't perform any miracles, but before that time he had performed a number of miracles. Just the 15 miles north of Nazareth, Sometime before, he had changed water into wine. They must have heard of that. Before he ever made this speech in Nazareth, he had healed a boy that was way over in Capernaum and in Jesus was at Canaan. And the attendant of the king came to Jesus and said, my boy is ill and he'll die unless you hurry to Capernaum. And Jesus said to the man, your boy will live. And in the very hour that Jesus said that, the boy in Capernaum's fever left him and he became well. Those in Nazareth must have heard of these miracles. Before he spoke in Nazareth, he was down in the temple in Jerusalem. And the first occasion of his cleansing the temple. And the scripture tells us that everybody in Galilee had heard of the works of Jesus in the temple. But those in Nazareth, they didn't accept him that day when he read that scripture. And before he was done talking and telling them about Isaiah and how a prophet doesn't have any honor in his own home, they ran him out and they were ready to throw him over the hillside of the city of Nazareth and have him killed, throw him down headlong. But the scripture says that Jesus slipped out in their midst and disappeared. But a little later, he went back to Nazareth. He went into the synagogue again, and he told him a second time. A prophet has no honor in his own country. And therefore, because of the lack of faith, he did not cure many in that city. But in other cities, he performed great miracles. But the point is, when Jesus walked on this earth, every Sabbath, he was in the synagogue with his fellow man or in the temple at Jerusalem. Should we, the footstep followers of Christ Jesus, be any different than Jesus was? And the Apostle Paul, where did we find him? In the synagogue on the Sabbath, when he had to make tents and he was working with Priscilla and Aquila. Every Sabbath he went to the synagogue and there he preached. And as you read the account of Paul, due to this preaching, he brought many, many people into the truth. You can bring people right into the truth here. A brother told me this morning that as an item of interest last uh, summer when I was down a year ago down in Richmond and gave the public talk, the person who used to come to meetings for seven or eight years ago, he thought, well, I'll go here, Brother Nor, and see what he has to say. So he came to the public meeting. He heard the talk, and the brother told me this morning, from that very day, he hasn't missed a meeting. Well, you see, even in a, in a kingdom hall, in a meeting place of God's people at a convention, something can be said on the platform that'll turn the whole life of a person around, change his whole way of thinking, and that has happened time and time again in all the kingdom halls of God's people around the world where someone has given a public talk and stimulated a person into action. Or in the Watchtower Studies or the Theocratic Ministry School. How good Jehovah has been to us in making all these provisions, the Congregation Book Studies, the Theocratic Ministry School, the Service Meeting, the Watchtower Study, the Public Meeting. If we do not forsake the house of our God, to go there and be built up spiritually, made strong to serve him. The arrangement's there. All we have to do is take advantage of it. Brothers, do not neglect the house of your God. 
We all have the same one, Jehovah. And those who neglect them are certainly going to be the losers and never get everlasting life. This hall, uh, as I said before, is very, very nice. It's a society's headquarters, but it's a kingdom hall too for three congregations here in Pittsburgh. The central unit is the main one that looks after it, and they've just painted it and uh, fixed it up in very, very fine shape. And I think uh, all of us would like to say thank you very much to the central unit and all the brothers that helped them in keeping this kingdom hall in such fine shape. They haven't neglected it. Here's another message that has been sent in, just came. It's from the Toronto Bethel family. Please accept our warm Christian love and best wishes as you meet together for this hop happy and upbuilding occasion. Be assured of our determination to press on with the preaching of this good news of the kingdom and of our joy in serving with you in Jehovah's Advancing Organization, Toronto Bethel family. This notice also says that there were 1,680 here in attendance. That's very, very good. Last year there were 1,507. So this house of God hasn't been neglected on this meeting either. And we are very, very pleased to have all of you here. The uh, contributions that will be made at this meeting, if anyone cares to make any contributions, will all go to the society. It doesn't go to the congregation. It will be used to uh, help and advance the work of our brothers throughout the world sending out missionaries. We have just graduated a few days ago, 108 students from the Gilead School, and most of those are on their way now to foreign lands. On October the 11th, uh, next week, many of our brothers are coming in. Some are already arrived for the next class of Gilead. They will go through a 20-week course and then they will be sent to the ends of the earth to carry on this grand ministry. Many of them in due time will have to branch out from the missionary home because every missionary home becomes a little kingdom hall. And when four or five or six people get into a city where there are no publishers, they have their regular meetings there amongst themselves and gradually those who study with them come in and the, kingdom, the missionary home becomes a kingdom hall. And after the congregation grows big enough, then it spreads out into other places that they rent. Every branch home, when we build a new one, has in it a kingdom hall. We always build a large kingdom hall that will accommodate anywhere from 150 to 200, because we have faith that not many people in the city will eventually meet there. But sometimes as the branches grow, then we have to turn the kingdom hall into an office because the office we plan becomes too small and the society or the brothers in the congregation will go out and build another one. And so the expansion goes on. So we're very grateful to Jehovah for his organization and the guidance he has given it. We appreciate this opportunity of coming together once a year with our brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh and those from, well, many states who come to this meeting. And we'd like very much for all of you to take our warm love and greetings back to your various congregations and those you meet. And we do pray that Jehovah's rich blessing will go with all of you. And now it's coming to closing time and I think uh, we better adjourn this meeting. The board of directors, as I said, will meet probably Let's see, what's today? Friday. I think we'll meet next Thursday. Some of the directors are away at the moment, so we'll, on business, so we'll wait till they return. And then we'll have a meeting and uh, elect our officers. And I know that everyone who takes on a responsible position will truly devote themselves wholly to it in your interests so that this good news of the kingdom can be preached in all the world. Let us now adjourn this meeting. And will we stand and close with prayer? <laughs>